The Stanford Center for Biomedical Ethics engages in research that uses both empirical and normative interdisciplinary methods to explore a wide range of issues in bioethics, including genetics, research ethics, end-of-life issues, organ transplantation, and a whole range of other issues. We have extensive services, including a clinical ethics service that we run at both hospitals here, as well as a research ethics consultation service where we provide ethical guidance to researchers. A lot of our research comes out out of our clinical ethics work and comes out of our research ethics consultations so that we work quite well collaboratively with colleagues from around the university and around the country, not just other people in our field. It's really important to focus on ethical, legal, and social issues alongside the study of genetics and genomics. We are talking about gene therapies, uh, we're talking about embryo screening. These are things that affect everybody throughout the world. And other people and the public need to be able to give input. Non-invasive prenatal testing is a genetic test that's different from other tests in that it doesn't involve taking a sample from a living fetus using a large needle. Companies that are using non-invasive prenatal testing currently have actually capitalized on some of the work that we've done at the Center for Biomedical Ethics. For example, we were asked to do a ethical consult for companies and developed best ethical practices in non-invasive prenatal testing. Researchers here at Stanford developed a smart toilet that has a lot of promise because you can analyze uh, using sensors and other types of ways of analyzing the data. You can find out a number of things about someone's health, you know, from cancer risk um, to other issues from their urine and excretion. But as you can imagine, this has very heightened privacy concerns, especially uh, since the Dobbs decision uh, overturned Roe, uh, where there is a lot more understanding publicly of how data that is used um, for about someone's health uh, can be used then to track them, use them for uh, legal or even criminal justice purposes. There's a very long, persistent, and ugly history of using genetic claims to validate social inequalities, to justify racist, classist, ableist attitudes. A lot of the work that I do here at SICBI is focused on trying to examine the broad social impacts of research. There is well-documented evidence that we continue to think of race as a biological construct. This belief is really harmful, um, not only because race is a social construct, but when we think of race as a biological construct, we not only allow ourselves to perpetuate the effects of structural racism in society, but we also absolve ourselves of any responsibility to do something about it. And I think there's been a real shift towards thinking more about disability as a justice issue and how we can center the voices of people with disabilities, their experiences, their perspectives of benefits and risks towards addressing some of the systemic injustices that they face in healthcare and in society at large. People with disabilities historically have had an incredibly hard time accessing even the most basic kind of healthcare. Um, and that's still a very significant problem today. So these access issues lead to really poor healthcare outcomes and actually reduce quality of life and length of life expectancy for people with disabilities. At the Stanford Center for Biomedical Ethics, we try to prioritize the intersection of disability and bioethics in three main ways. Number one, in the kind of research we do and the kinds of research questions we ask. Number two, in making sure we include people with disabilities in the research we do as participants. And number three, we center it by actually hiring people with disabilities and including people with disabilities in our workforce because we think that's absolutely critical to making sure that we model what we preach in terms of disability and equity and justice. I do like to advocate for more dialogue between the rare disease community and the disability community. In the rare disease community, the focus tends to be on therapy um, and a medical model of disability. And there are some uh, in the disability community who also have rare diseases who uh, feel that the focus should be more on quality of life of current patients and encouraging um, acceptance and uh, uh, accessibility of our society to um, current patients and families. In the last 15 years, we've gone from barely understanding one genome to 
uh, incredible advances in the technology. And the reality is we'll never be done because we're trying to keep up with the science and we really need to be as innovative in our thinking and bioethics as the scientists and those who are moving the technology forward are being uh, in their work. The Center for Biomedical Ethics is a very special place. We have outstanding faculty who not only do great research and do a great job of teaching and mentoring people, but they actually do work that makes a real impact to improve the lives of patients and citizens, and especially for people who have disabilities, for people of racial and ethnic groups who are disadvantaged. And I think that's really the hallmark of what's really special about this place.